It's great to be part of the kingdom of God. It's great to be part of what you're doing to build his kingdom. Isn't it? And we all, whatever we do, because of your faith promise, we put personnel in different parts of the world in a long-term basis that brings about great impact and great results for the kingdom growth. If not for your prayers and your giving, faith promise, uh, not very much can happen. I, I, I know God can do a lot of things, but he chooses to use you and I to build his kingdom. Isn't it? Even a salvation plan is simply through you and I. It's, it's Jesus accomplished everything, but to proclaim his gospel. You know, the kingdom of God comes through hearing. That's how it says. Hearing through the gospel. I know that many kingdoms could come in many different ways. But the kingdom of God comes through proclamation. This morning, I want to take a passage and share with you what God is doing in France. Uh, of course, uh, when we went in, in, to Madagascar in 1995, there were about 30, 40 Assembly of God churches. And because of your faithfulness, because of the churches in Wyoming, that's, that's where I'm ordained, part of a member of Wyoming Network. Uh, ministers network in the last 20 years or so the church has grown from 30 to 40, 30 40 churches to 1200 churches that's the impact of faith promise that's the impact of faith promise that's the impact of your prayer and like pastor craig said uh, we have great great plans to plant 500 churches in five years and 1000 churches in the next 10 years by 20, 2033 and i know with your help with your prayers and with god's amazing intervention in france we're going to get to that point hallelujah and in in romans i want to take and talk about romans chapter 10 verses 13 and 15 through 13 through 15 is what i would like to touch it's it's a great 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 verse that paul writes about when you go into Romans, when you go into the letter of romans usually at least myself in the beginning, 30 years ago, I was a student, or a little more than that. Um, I was a student in, in a Bible school, and I thought Romans was, man, that's heavy on doctrine, heavy on doctrine of salvation, doctrine on sin, doctrine of man, and, and we even created a systematic doctrine out of it, which is great to learn. It's a learning, the way to learn. But Romans, actually, Paul uses it not not to make it as a systematic doctrine, which is good, which is what he's also trying to play, um, put together. But Romans is basically a love letter on behalf of the lost. In fact, that's what he says. In fact, he says in Romans chapter 10, verse 13, he says, Whosoever call up, calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. It's, it's great, isn't it? Romans, Paul did. Paul wrote Romans, but Paul did not plant the church of Romans. Paul did not plant Antioch where he was set apart. He did not plant Alexandria churches. But Paul had an intention. He said, I want to go to Rome as a missionary. I want to go and see how I can help the lost to come back. And he's writing eventually, and he's writing to Rome, and he's saying, Whosoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. That's, isn't it? That's easy. You know, That's the only verse you need in Romans. You don't need anything else. That's it. But why is it so complicated? Why is it? Why, why does it take? I, I, I grew up in India, and uh, there we have 300 million gods. And uh, yeah, I mean, all you have to go is say, no, whosoever call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. No, no, we need 300 million gods. Or, or, or even the, uh, I, I, I ministered in Madagascar. My wife and I, we, we were there. Our kids grew up there in Madagascar for almost 17 years. And then there they have another, another system. It's, I remember one time, my wife and I, we just first moved into a house in 1995. That's a, that's a few years ago. <laughs> With our two little kids, uh, 4 o'clock in the morning, there were drum noise and trumpet and everything right next door to the wall. We had a wall on them one side and... My wife, 4 o'clock in the morning, I'm going to go check it out. I said, okay, I'll also come with you. I didn't want to. No, I didn't want. I said, that's just noise. I grew up in India. I'm a little bit used to noise. She grew up in Gillette, Wyoming. No noise at 4 o'clock in the morning. <laughs> and, 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 and she looked, and apparently there was a tomb next door to us. And they were trying to get uh, 
the dead body after year. And that's what they do. Is That's what we learned then, is to take that body and go to one of their houses and, and talk, have a seance and talk to them. You know, whosoever call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. You don't need to do that, all those stuff at 4 o'clock in the morning. You know, uh, and you can go on another religion. I, I'll just stick with the religion that I know. As a matter of fact, we have a lot of reincarnation in India. And as a matter of fact, uh, if a mother lives a wonderful life, has a lot of children, give a lot of money to a lot of poor people, she gets to come back as a cow next, next life. That's why the cows are sacred. So the next time you eat a steak, you say bye-bye, Grandma. But, <laughs> <laughs> sorry, I can pick on my own religion. I won't touch any other religion. <laughs> but, but what Paul is trying, is, it, he, he uses the word, it's not, just a, uh, it's not just that simple to say, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. In fact, he builds from one, chapter 1 all the way to chapter 10, he builds a gospel logic where he uses in chapter 1 verses 18 through 19. He uses uh, the verse, uh, he says, it, he uses two words. This world is full of godlessness and unrighteousness. Godlessness meaning we have a very corrupt, distorted, denying view of God or how we construct, reconstruct, destruct all kinds of ways to show what God is. And, and he's saying there is, that is godlessness. He, he, what he's trying to say is simply, in, in, as a matter of fact, uh, can anybody know a real God? He's saying, no, not one in chapter 3. So he's building all the way up to chapter 10. And then he introduces this. In, in, in fact, uh, the way that he brings the first point, I can, I can go to the first point, is simply this. In all of it, he's trying to build one, one of the biggest points in Romans is... The greatest defining condition of this world is lostness. There's nothing, I mean, there are a lot of sins, yeah. We have our favorite injustice program, that's great. We do a lot of sin that we think uh, should be highly emphasized, that's okay. But for Paul, the bottom line is the greatest defining condition of the world is lostness. And he's all people, that's what he would like to say is godlessness. He uses the word godlessness. He says, all people have heard about God and rejected him. There's no not one that is not rejected. Sometimes I would like to think there's in a virgin island, there's one person that's not corrupt at all. He might have a great, great, great view about God. Paul says, no, not one. Of course, I want to add, not even in the United States of America. I mean, there is, there is somehow, we have come to the point. So Paul is saying, lostness is the bottom line. And we have to, and in fact, that's what Jesus looks at Jerusalem and he cries and says, Oh, I wish how they would have accepted me. They're so lost. There's a cry there of lostness all, all across from Genesis to Revelation. Our God is a God of mission. Our God is a God of redemption. I remember in France, uh, we, we planted a church few years ago along with the French pastors and uh, in a city called Rouen, R-O-U-E-N. And the pastor is there. His name is Ivan Kassar. And uh, we went there. He started 10 years ago and he was saying, Manuel, I need a play. We need to get a building because I have a room that will only seat 50 people. And he got 50, second year, 100, third year. So he was growing and he, he, he did four or five services. So the first year he went and asked the mayor, in, in, in France, if you want to plant a church and if you want to build a church, you have to go to the mayor and ask the permission. And so he went to the mayor in Rouen and said, I would like a land. And the mayor said, no, first year. So second year he went and said, can I have one now? No. Third year, fourth year, fifth year, sixth year, no, no, no. So he said, well, I'll have five services. That's what he was having. 30 people, 35 people to sit comfortably. He did that. And he invited an evangelist who came. And that evangelist just said, uh, prophesied. He said, I see gold raining from heaven. And the pastor goes, oh, no. <laughs> I wish that was true. <laughs> you know, we all know that. And, uh, and you are going to be, I'm going to be coming and testifying about it. You're going to testify about it. I'm going to come next year and you'll tell me. And the pastor is thinking to him, himself, Ivan Kassar, he's thinking, well, if it doesn't come, you're not coming back. 
So what happened? Everything was over. The same week, Ivan is going to go. Ivan is going to go check uh, the mail. He opens the mail. There is a letter from a notary saying, you have $50,000 in my office. You can come and pick it up. And he goes, this is a scam, the pastor. <laughs> We're all a little of faith, a no, little faith. And then he says, well, I'll find out even if this notary exists in Rome. So he went and Googled like we do. You know, Google has become a great source for us. And uh, he went in and he found out, yeah, the notary is there. His office is there. He went straight there and said, what is this letter all about? He said, oh, there was a lady, older lady. She came and gave this check to you. This is yours for your church. She heard that you're going to start a church in Normandy region in Rouen. And she has a burden for this. She gave it. And he found that lady and he went to her and said, thank you so much. You're welcome to come to my church. And uh, she is one of those ladies that is uh, old style because she is that generation. I'm older, so she's in her uh, age. I don't want a certain age. Let's call that that way. <laughs> and in those days, those people had a hair. I don't have any, so I can't even. Uh, they had a hair that they would put a big, uh, not a nest-like thing, at a bun. Okay, it goes up. And she's all dressed up, and she's ready to come to church Sunday. She comes, and she sits there, and pastor is looking at her and saying, Ooh, she's here. And uh, that Sunday, the youth were leading the worship. And when the youth leads worship, it's going to be loud. It's going to be jumping up and down. It's going to be music, worship. That's great music, excellent. But he's wondering, that lady just gave us 50 grand, man. we just calm down a little bit, you know. <laughs> Why did I even invite her? And when the service was over, he was out and everybody is leaving and the pastor says goodbye and, to, and this lady walks by she opens her bible takes in another envelope and gives it to him and said this is the second part of it and after everybody left he opens there opens the envelope and there was another fifty thousand dollar check on it armed with a hundred thousand dollars he goes to the mayor now <laughs> mayor i need a church but i need a land and, and, and he didn't even ask anything he walks into the mayor's office and she is she belongs to a communist party in those days, and even now they have it. But that's the mayor there at that time, uh, a few years ago. And she looked at the pastor and said, you know what? Whatever your question is, whatever you ask, whatever you have, any question you have, the answer is yes. Wow. And uh, he found a land, and that's the land. Uh, in fact, a few months ago, I preached in the church. They have 450 people. You know, we can, we can see how God invades the darkness. In fact, uh, uh, the, the, the defining condition of the lostness, where people will, will, will be, in a sense, godlessness. Isn't it? And, and, and that's what it's all about, the front line. The France is the front line for secularism. France is the front line for secularism. What is secularism? Basically, they say, God, you just put him on the side. Man is the center of everything. Man will find a solution for everything. That's what secularism is all about. God is just, if he's there, he'll just uh, stand outside. I, I remember talking to a French guy, and I was doing a classic evangelism when I first went to France. Hey, if you, when, you, if, when you die, and uh, do you know where you would go? Would you go to heaven or, you know, I, I got to know him a little bit before I could ask the question. I won't ask those questions the first time. But, and he looked at me and he said, you know, who cares where we go? So it's, it's, a, it's a secularist view. It's a, in 1779, 1789, when they had the revolution, they established in France when the local people and military together threw out the monarchy and the church power at the time together, they said, Reason is the center of our religion in France. There is no other region. Religion. Reason. The cult of reason we call it. But what I'm trying to say simply is, it, it is not something new then. It was even in John's time. When John wrote the gospel, he said, In the beginning was God. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. And, and he goes on to say, he uses the word logos, and that's where we get the word logic, isn't it? You know, what he says is simply, he comes to verse 5, and he says on, The light, that light, that logos, that light came to darkness, and the darkness could not understand, is one version. Overcome is another version. If you want the French version, the darkness could not master the light. 
So it's, it's a symbolic, using light and darkness as symbolic, is what he's trying to say is darkness doesn't understand the light. That's why their godlessness exists. And we need to somehow penetrate into that darkness to make them capture the gospel, the love of Jesus Christ. That's what lostness is all about. And John basically he came into those days and when the Greek philosophers and them looking at the sky and saying, wow, that star and that thing, they use the word, there's a logos behind that. For them, logos was some kind of a divine phenomena or a divine, divine principle. And that's why John writes it. No, it's not a divine, neither a phenomena nor a principle. It is a person. He was with us. He was before this world. He created this world. Nothing that was created was created without, uh, with him, without him. Everything was created with him as the creator. And that's why he said, when that light came, and later on he says, he came to his own and the own rejected. But those who he gave, the, but those who accepted him, those who believed in him, he gave them the power to be the children. In verse 14. But he says, that light and the darkness could not comprehend that light. In French, I like it. It says, Maitrise, maitrise, master. The darkness could not master. Wow, I wish I can understand that light. And you and I, with your faith promise, with the, uh, with the weapon of your faith promise, with your prayer, we partner together and show and make them understand through the power of the Holy Spirit, empowered with the power of the Holy Spirit. We go and say, yes, whosoever call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. You don't need to have a calf or a cow, or you don't need to have 330 million gods. You don't need to have this. He has all already accomplished his work. And that's what Paul is trying to come and establish that point. And he says, how can they call? That's where the, that's where the next question comes in. How, can, how, how then can they call on the one they have not believed in? And how can they believe in the one of whom they have not heard? And how can they hear without someone preaching to them? And how can anyone preach unless they are sent? As it is written... How beautiful are the hair. No. How beautiful. I'm glad he said feet. We all wear shoes, don't we? <laughs> How beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. That's where he says, man, how can they do it? It is you and I going together. And that's my second point is simply this. We make disciples of all the nations together. By going. Some go, some stay, but we all together make disciples. That's what it's all about. Casper, I should say, Radius Church has been doing that for many years. I thank God for your faithfulness. I thank God for your generosity. You know what that turns into? We go into all the world. We make disciples. That's the only commission that God, Jesus, has left with us. Yes, he didn't give us a commission to go dig wells as much as I did a lot of wells in Madagascar. He didn't say start many schools. I've done a lot of primary schools. In fact, I do one, one of them. Uh, he didn't say go do this ministry, that ministry. We do all of those things. But the fundamental foundational basic ministry that he called you and I together to go all the nations is to make disciples. And we did that. If you can run that video, there's a city called Amiens, A-M-I-E-N-S. You will see it. And uh, Amiens, during the World War II, I think my speaking would be better than the little music, but it's okay. <laughs> I was just kidding. You can, uh, uh, in Amiens, in, 19, in the Second World War, that church was blown apart, shambled, World War bombing. So the people went around all across the city, and they took the bricks, and they blew it open. Whatever they could salvage, they brought it to the church. And they built a beautiful church. And, and you saw that in the, this is not the church. The church that was before. Beautiful church. And this is the latest that I'll tell you the story. They built a beautiful church. In 1958, Pastor Moise, what we call in English is Moses, built the church. I was in that church late, not in that year, 10 years ago when this pastor came along that you saw the photo. His name is Tony Tormator. He came along and he said Manuel, I, I'll tell you the story of how we came into this building. And he said we were in that building where it was bombed and he has the clip. He gave me the video by the way and what happened was simply 
I tried to offer a bid, the highest bid for a building, and the, the, the owner of that building said, I would not sell it to you because you're going to build a church. But in France, it's illegal not to offer the building for the highest bidder. bidder. So he said, I'm going to go sue them. And this pastor, Tony Tornator, he, um, he went, said, I'm going to sue him. So he was ready to do, do that. <laughs> you know, he was attending a pastor's conference along with us at one time. And there was a prophecy that said, somebody is here is trying to build a building. He said, okay, many pastors can build a building. It's not me. I'm one of them. Then he says, but you, you offered the biggest, highest bid. And you think uh, you needed that and you're going to go sue him. And he goes, oops, it's me. <laughs> and he says, uh, and the, prophet, uh, the prophecy moved on. He said, you were rejected. Your offer was rejected by the man you think, but it was not rejected by him. It was rejected by God. I want you to focus on building disciples. I wanted you to focus on how this church was started with broken walls, buildings where the damaged bricks were brought in and built. And I want you to focus on people coming in, broken people coming and being restored, redeemed, revived, changed, resourced. They said, oh God, I'll do that. Soon after that, God gave him three times the size of that building that you saw in that building. And one of the building team from Nebraska came and helped build the church. It's, it's great. And today... He has 500 people. You saw the sanctuary. I was in that church also. And, and, and this is what we do. You know, we make disciples of all nation together by going. And my final point is simply this uh, from Paul. This is what Paul does. We plant churches. We plant churches. Planting churches creates access to the gospel. That's why we plant churches. That's why we build buildings. That's why we do things. Uh, that Because it creates access. We need to create access. And that's what Paul does. I believe in church planting. In fact, we'll be planting a lot of church. But beyond church planting is bringing the kingdom of God to the community. And bringing the kingdom of, the God, kingdom of God to the community involves planting churches. That creates access. You know, faith comes... From hearing, that's what we read in verse 17. I won't go into it. Consequently, faith comes from hearing the message. And the message is heard through the word about Christ. People have to hear it to benefit from it. And we give access to create that church by building churches. In Paris, Paris is about, in the city itself is 3 million people. If you add all the suburbs, which is you just walk outside the city, <laughs> it's like from here going to Evansville. And it's, it's there. It's 13 million people. And uh, it's hard driving that I've tried that several times. I still do it. But <clears throat> 13 million people, we have one church for every 250,000 people in Paris. As a whole in France, I think we have it one for 100,000, but in Paris alone, one for every 250,000 people. That means in Wyoming, you will have only two churches. If Wyoming was a state in France, in Paris, it's a city in Paris, or let me go to Springfield, Missouri. Springfield has Missouri Assembly of God churches, 60 Assembly of God churches, Assembly of God churches or more. And if it was a city in France, it would have one church. And 59 other churches will be closed. And one of them that will be closed is James River. Because we don't have that big a church. <laughs> what I'm trying to say is we plant churches to create access to the gospel. And we were saying, man, what can we do in, in Paris? We, we do plant churches in Paris. One time, a few years ago, one of our friends said, well, I'm going to go start a church in Paris in the southern part of it. In a city, in a suburb called, not a city, suburb called Cretai, C-R-E-T-E-I-L. You can Google it later on. And he said, okay, he started, he rented a little room, 50 people, 30 people, and start, people started coming and everything. He had finally he had about 300 people, but he couldn't, he had to go seven services. Can you imagine? He said, God, give me a building, give me a land. It's going to cost a lot of millions of dollars. One time the mayor of Cretai called him. 
I hear you have services and you have seven of them, seven times every weekend with 30 people each. It's not like a seven times of 5,000 people, you know, that'd be great. <laughs> but he said, yes, I want you to lead a foundation that where the city is going to put together. It's going to, you can have a church there. There'll be a restaurant, there'll be a conference center, and there'll be a cafe. And he gave all the thing and it's going to cost a lot of money. You'll be responsible only for 10%. Okay, he said, okay, he didn't have a penny. He said, okay. And they built a beautiful building. You can, you can start the video on that second video. You, can, you will see the building. Beautiful building. <laughs> and it ended, it's called MLK Church. That's the pastor. Yvonne Carluer is the pastor. I'm standing on the rooftop on that church. That's the church. And, 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 and he built it. You know, when he built it, it was finished in 2020 in January. And COVID hit. And we had to close the church for a whole year. Now everything goes, how are you going to pay? You know, so we started, like you all, we started live streaming there. It wasn't a big thing. So he started, he had about 200 people on the YouTube viewing. At the end of the COVID, he had 30,000. Today he has 50,000 YouTube viewers. And, and after COVID, we opened the church. There's only 2,000, 2,500 seats. The 2,500 seats were filled and he had to go to the second service right away. And it went to 5,000. He said, God, I don't want to do three, five, six services again. So he made an announcement. This is funny. He made an announcement. He said, if you're a mature Christian, please stay home and start a watch party, watch group, and let new people can come here. He said, <laughs> I said, I wouldn't announce that. Mature people is the one who pay the toilet. But anyway, <laughs> no, here in America, it's in America. Everybody does that. I know that. You're all mature. But, but it's, 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 <laughs> and he says, this is what he said. He announced it. In fact, you can go back in the YouTube and watch that, but it'll be in French, by the way. And then he said, and he, we were talking one day and he's saying, you know, 50,000 people watch us and they leave. What do we do with them? And he came up with an idea. He said, I'm going to announce that they could watch in groups and I'm going to ask them to register with our organization in our church. And 300 groups already signed up for it. And we had to, you know, you have to check 300 of them. You can't just say everybody could start. So we kind of vetted them. We went them. They need to come and do the training. And this is what they need to do in their group. They will have to watch the, video, the sermon. They will have to take communion. They will have to eat together. And they will have to discuss the sermon. That makes it a group of 12 people. And the leader needs to be part of a training program that he needs to come once a month to the main building, to here in Paris, once a month. And the rest is online. And you know what? We came up with 53. We launched this January, last January. 53 different groups were launched. You talk about planting 500 churches, already 53 is already on their, in their way to plant it. God works in miraculous works. We build, plant churches to create this access and through this access all across in fact 300 300 groups are asking us to plant and one of them is in indonesia <laughs> a couple of them in madagascar we said okay go do it we can we can incorporate them in our organization you're outside but we say yes do it you can watch you can do it god is doing some miraculous work france is in the brink of revival what we call is the pre-revival and you're part of it you're part of it because today we're going to celebrate that by saying, Lord, by faith, by faith, I'm going to promise to give in order to reach not only France, not only Wyoming, not only United States, all across globally. We're going to add four more missionaries to this group. Three of them, we can't say their name. One of them, we could. He's the youth alive. But three of them we won't be able to. But if you need to know the name, I'm sure our names will be there. Where they're going, you can talk individually to your pastors. But what I'm trying to say is this is going to happen from city to city, village to village, town to town. We're going to create access because the defining condition of this world is lostness. My wife and I will be moving into a new city called Ren, R-E-N-N-E-S. For Americans, it's Rennes. But for French, it's Ren. <laughs> And there's 700,000 people with one church, 70,000 students. We're going to go in there. You can go into that. Uh, uh, in fact, uh, this, um, that's the city that, okay, 
You can go next also. I skipped this echo. This is the where we are going. Population 400,000 in the city, but the suburb is 700,000. We'll be going into it. Thank you, Don. I appreciate my, it's my mix-up. <laughs> but uh, what we're trying to do in three weeks, you can go to the slide previously that we skipped. In three weeks, we're going to have a young adult summit, student summit, May 2023. And uh, I, they've asked me to come for it. 6,500 students in France have signed up for this. That's, I'm going, one thing we know, this is not going to be a student summit you come and enjoy and leave. This is going to be one of the greatest recruitment event it's going to be. We have created a one-year training program for all 6,500 to be followed up with their email online. And we're going to ask them to give one year of their life to their local church, whether to do children's ministry, youth ministry, music ministry, worship ministry, or, or evangelism ministry, they have to write down their project and send it to us. And even if 20% send it to us, that's 1,300 people. Uh, we believe we can plant 130, uh, 30 churches with 1,300 people because we need 10 people for each church. And that's what's happening in three weeks, May 19th through 21st. And uh, Springfield, Missouri, leaders... Missouri leaders, I did say misery, isn't it? Uh, <laughs> they heard about that and they said, we're going to come to that. So it's great. My regional director, another uh, 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 AG uh, missionary, and he works with them. He's a relational guy. His name is John Easter. He's coming. And they're also sending a communications team for this. I'm saying, wow, it's exciting. God is doing some exciting things. You know, they could come and see what God is doing. It's all because of people like you who took this card that you're going to, Pastor Craig is going to come and talk about it a little bit more. I'll, I'll finish it in two minutes. And we're going to sign up and say, God, help me to do this again and again and again and again in every town, village in this world. We're going to stand behind what God is doing. You know, that's what happened in 1895. You can go to the last slide. Thank you. I appreciate that very much. They're doing a great job in your church. You guys are blessed. This lady, have you ever heard about Amy Carmichael? Anybody heard about Amy Carmichael? She came to India in 1895. And she prayed about India. And she said, Lord, there's a temple's where the young girls are sold to the temple. And uh, so she, God says, please minister to those young girls. Send somebody. God said, no, Amy, you're going. So 1895, she came to India. And in 19, 18, oh, 1901, she met a young lady. She met a lot of young ladies, 13-year-old, 11-year-old, 12-year-old. And uh, there was an 11-year-old who came to her and talked about Jesus. Tell me about Jesus. She was in that temple. She's came out and talked to Amy. Amy went and ministered. And that young girl, 11-year-old, she accepted Jesus. She went home and said, I'm not going back to the temple. I accepted Jesus. And the parents packed her suitcase and said, left it outside on the pavement. 11-year-old said, you can go there. If you're not going to the temple, you're never coming back to this house again. She went to Amy and said, uh, Madam, Madam Amy Carmichael, I'm with no place to live. And she said, you come and you live with us. I have other girls that I've collected, like they're staying with us. So this young girl, 11-year-old, came up, stayed. She grew up there. At age 18, she became the right hand for Amy Carmichael. She became the dean of girls' ministry. She was the one that's helping Amy with a lot of things. And then she got married. She got married, and she had five children, four sons and one daughter. And that one daughter is my mom. I am a debtor. <laughs> I am a debtor. That's what we go. That's why we want to plant churches. That's what we want. That's why we make disciples. That's why we understand the defining condition of this world. The enemy has darkened them to the extent that they could not understand the light. And we go, you pray, you send, you come with us. We make disciples together. 
So as we close, I would like for you to stand up and I'd like the musicians to come up. I'm going to ask God to speak to you right now in a powerful way. I don't know how he wants to use you. But this morning we're going to do one activity together and that's our faith promise. But he's going to speak to you in different ways that you will process it in the coming days. You don't have to respond right away today. You have to process it. But I'm going to pray before I give the mic to Pastor Craig. But I believe there are many, many Amy Carmichaels, not in the same way, same form of ministry, but to somehow partner in this world. I'm standing here because of people like you that gave to Amy. I'm standing here because of people like you that prayed for the missionaries that come now, that prayed for Amy in those days. I go there. When I go back to India, I go there and I look at that place. Nowadays, they made it into a hospital, Amy Carmichael's place. I look at it and I say, wow, that's my root. That's where I come from. That's where my grandma comes from. And I have my dad's dad. That's a different story for a different time. But I'm going to ask you to ask God, Lord, help me to up the intensity. Help me to move. You don't have to do great things. Simple things. Lord, let me move from here to there. Let me, let me up the intensity and understand the intensity of lostness. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. How, how can they call upon somebody that they do not know? How can they believe on somebody that do, they do not know? Who will go preach to them? Who will send them? How will they know about Jesus? It's through you and I. Heavenly Father, I pray right now, as we stand before you, let your Holy Spirit, Lord, come into our hearts in a mighty way, in a powerful way. We want to encounter your presence and your message and your hand this morning in this place, O oh Lord. Move by your Spirit, O oh God. Let us come with the understanding what, of what lostness means to you. You came to your own, you said, Jesus. And they rejected me. They did not understand me why I came. Today, Lord, by your power, by your love, by your resources that give through, you give through our people, Lord, we're going to reach this world. We're going to make disciples. We're going to make access. We're going to build churches. We give you the glory, honor, and praise in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Amen, amen, amen.